coming up, the story of an all-time 70s number one hit that has as much drama and intrigue as any song ever recorded. An example of everyone trying to force a song, force fit it to be something that it wasn't. In the end, though, the song won the battle. First of all, it was 12 minutes long, with the first four minutes recorded as an extended instrumental section that had the legendary group furious that their vocals were you know, being increasingly pushed to the background by an off-the-wall producer. And then that producer had the singer record dozens of takes to the point of exhaustion. It got so bad that after the song was finished, he was fired, the producer was, down the road. It would be the last uh, massive hit that this band would have. There are so many urban legends thrown around about this song, and we'll get the real story from the last remaining member of this band, this Hall of Fame group, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you believe that a song is the closest thing that we have to a time machine in this world, you're going to enjoy this channel. Make sure to subscribe right now so you don't miss an episode. Hit the red button, check the bell, all that stuff. So you always know when our latest videos come out. We have a lot of great interviews coming out. I'm really excited. Uh, also, give us a look on Patreon where we have more content, and that helps us to do more interviews. That's what it's all about here, guys. So I'm really excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, our most popular show on here, where uh, featured artists reveal hard to, to find stories about their biggest songs and fascinating insight about their careers. You won't really find this anywhere else. In 1972, a song hit number one that was just under seven minutes long. And that was even edited down because the album version was 12 minutes long. The song was a masterpiece that we're still talking about today from a Hall of Fame group called The Temptations. It was a subject that hadn't really been covered by popular music quite like this before. Written by Norman Whitfield and Barrett Strong in 1971, uh, legend has it that Whitfield had a groove that he knew was something really special. So he called Barrett Strong, who actually had the first hit for Barry Gordy's Motown in 1960, uh, which is money, that's what I want. He also co-wrote I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Barrett Strong was no slouch, this guy was a hit maker. Now, Norman Whitfield, who had taken the Temptations down a psychedelic path for the last few years, wanted Barry Strong to write some really great lyrics for this song that he thought should be up-tempo and, and fun. Said Barrett about it, Norman said he wanted lyrics that were fun, not serious, so listeners would have a good time with the song. But as I listened over and over after Norman left, I just didn't hear the music the way he did. He went on to say, there was something about the bass line that spoke to me. It was the sound of someone confused about something and was trying to make sense of it. Barrett Strong would key in on the phrase, Papa was a Rolling Stone saying, Rolling Stone was a phrase that uh, he used all the time. Uh, he heard it in his neighborhood, going back all the way to the 50s. It meant a guy who you know, couldn't settle down. Even if he had a wife and kids, it was from the old proverb, a rolling stone gathers no moss. This was again a subject not confronted on pop radio. Deadbeat dads, Johnny Cash, you know, he did the Shel Silverstein poem, A Boy Named Sue. But the lyrics were so funny and, and the music was so upbeat, most people didn't realize what the song was about. Because before he left, he went and named me Sue. The music and lyrics of Papa Was a Rolling Stone were so direct and hazy, there was just no doubt. Never heard nothing but bad things about him. They set the tone that would be followed later in the decade by Harry Shapin with uh, Cats in the Cradle. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when. We'll get together then. Later, Bruce Springsteen with Adam Raised the Cane. And then much later in rap from Nas to Tyler the Creator. The song was actually written for the Motown band The Undisputed Truth before the Temps took it to number one. They gave it to this band first. The Undisputed Truth's version, that stalled at number 63. Now, The Undisputed Truth. 
They were active from the beginning of the 70s into about 1981. They were actually assembled by Norman Whitfield to record psychedelic soul music that was all the rage back then. Like I said, Norman did a lot of it. He also sang backing on hits like Ain't No Mountain High Enough for Diana Ross. Now, after the Undisputed Truth stalled outside of the top 50, Norman Whitfield took it to the Temptations, who had begun to get frustrated with Whitfield's recent emphasis on the instrumental elements of their songs. Kind of their vocals were an afterthought or pushed to the side. Now, the Temptations version starts with a long and intricate instrumental. It's about three minutes and 52 seconds. It's contemplative, though, moody, very beautiful. A huge bass line is heard over cymbal strikes, hand claps, funky, groovy guitar, and violin screeches, among so much more. The Funk Brothers on steroids, I'm telling you, they were amazing. The vocals featured Dennis Edwards, Melvin Franklin, Richard Treat, who had just become uh, Paul Williams' replacement due to his poor health, and Damon Harris, who had to replace Eddie Kendrick's signature falsetto. They share different lines, kind of implying the different siblings asking their mother about their now dead father. And mama, some bad talk going around town saying that Papa had three eyes. All the mother can tell them is that, you know, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, all he left us was alone. It's about as stark and clear as a song gets. The drama recording the song it's almost as thick as, as the song. Whitfield had upset the group with his focus on the music over their voices. And then he had Dennis Edwards sing his parts dozens and dozens of times to get exactly what he wanted, to which Dennis was angry about it until later when he heard the recording. And he said that he understood uh, what Norman was actually doing him a favor and what he was trying to do with the vocal. Right. Heard some talk about Papa doing some stuff and preaching. There was also an apocryphal urban legend told over and over again that Dennis Edwards wasn't a fan of the first verse. It said it was the 3rd of September. That day I'll always remember because that was the day that my daddy died. The day that my daddy died. It was said that Edwards' own father had died on that exact day. Later it was pointed out that his father had actually passed on the same day in October, a month later. Also, many said that Dennis took the song to heart and had a hard time with it because his, his father fit the description, which actually couldn't be further from the truth. As Dennis Edwards' father, he was no deadbeat dad. He was a minister, very close to his family all his life. So, you know, all the urban legends that go around, we're trying to solve all those. I'm, I'm depending on you. Tell me the truth. This elegant number one hit is a trip down the ever experimental psychedelic lane. And you think about it, very few artists have the talent and skill to tackle this subject so perfectly, musically and lyrically. Many Vietnam vets came home and told stories that it was a song that, you know, they played a lot as they trudged through the jungles. Coming up next, the last original member of The Temptations, a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Otis Williams, takes us back to the early 70s, places this ex the exact moment, tells us how it came together. Gosh, as we celebrate 60 years of the most successful R&B group in music history, everybody loves The Temptations. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. With uh, the fall coming, it's time for some new styles. You can design your own. You can do prescription frames. You can do sunglasses. Anyway, you can get it for less than the price of a vinyl record. You really can't beat that. Check it out at zenny.com today. Here are the temptations. It was first given to the Undisputed Truth. They had the huge number two smiling faces like we talked about. Faces, smiling faces sometimes. Then brought it to you. What did you think about that when he first brought uh, Papa Was a Rolling Stone? Like I would tell people, Papa Was a Rolling Stone almost didn't get made. We met up at uh, Studio Number Two, that, which was over on Davidson, uh, instead of on West Grand Boulevard. So uh, when we all came together, Dennis, 
Melvin, myself, Richard Street, and Damon Harris. Damon Harris, yeah, came into yeah. the group at that time. So when we, he played the track. And at the time we were kind of weary of the psychedelic soul, you know, because we out there and we hear people say, telling us, when y'all gonna come back to them ballads and those other kind of funk tunes and things. So we would try and tell Norman what our fans were saying out there, cause we out there in the public. And uh, he said, well, man, I tell you, you know, this is gonna be a hit. For however many heartbeats, uh, we had a verbal confrontation. All five of us, six of us really. We were saying, we don't wanna sing this, man. We're tired of it. We out there, we hear what the people want us to do. And Norman said, I promise you, I promise you this will be a hit when I finish it. So I said, all right, Timps, let's go on. We had to do, we're under contract, let's go on and do what we had to do. We went down uh, uh, in the studio and uh, we put the background on and then it was time for the leads. When you listen at him, when I listened at uh, uh, Dennis do his, his lead, it was almost like, I'm singing it, but I ain't feeling it. It was a third of down, very stoic. It was the third of September. And uh, I guess that helped sell the record. That day I'll always remember. Yes, I will. We almost didn't do it, but we went on and did it. And we had to fly to do some one nighters. And when Norman released it and he had the horns and the uh, the string arrangements and the sanctified claps that would come in. So he laid it, he laid a lot of great, uh, you know, elements to it. And it was one of those great kind of records that in the evening as you drive, you hear all that music. Dun, 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 dun. So it was great music to listen to and uh, ride with, but uh, almost didn't get made. Well, because of that, I have two Grammys from that one song. Two Grammys, and yeah. it was a number one hit, your fourth yeah. number one hit yeah. on both uh, charts. That day I'll always remember, yes I will. I also have always read about Dennis in that first line. Right. You had said in your, your autobiography that uh, that he did not want to sing that first line. He wanted him to change that line. Yeah, because it's in his father. It's his own died. father. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that dynamic. Well, you know, when we like make a short, we went and did it anyway. But David, I mean, Dennis did say that his father actually passed on that day, and I guess it brought back memories. That my daddy died. Uh, and for it to coincide with us singing it, and he's taking the lead to it, you know, there again, it almost uh, didn't get made. But I said, no, fellas, let's go on and do it. And yeah. we went down there. But, uh, yeah, it was kind of a sticky situation for a minute. Never heard nothing but bad things about him. And Dennis, too, I, I read that he was trying to kind of bring a little bit more to it, and they were trying to tone him down. No, sing it like this, and he wanted to kind of sing with more fervor. Yeah, well, Norman was, fervor. Yeah, Norman was always kind of picky hewn about how whatever song that he yeah. would write, and especially if it was something that he really believed in. You know, and uh, yeah, he said, no, I want it with this kind of id, you know. And so there again, when then it started singing the leads, you could hear a little, I don't want to sing this shit. But <laughs> yeah. <I> hear <laughs> yeah. Tell me the truth. Mama just hung her head and said, son. Yeah, well, the album version is 11 minutes and 44 seconds. And even the single edit is like seven minutes. That was unheard of back then well, for the radio see, to play that. Well, here's what's happening. See, back during those days, they had a format called Quiet Storm. So any time after five or six o'clock, see during the, uh, the premiere time of the day, right. they had the commercials. But once they got past six o'clock, this jockeys could stretch out, you know, so they would play songs and I think James Brown had something out long, you know, so they could yeah. get away with it after six o'clock, but it had to be after six. All during the day, they would do the short version. So they didn't get those commercials in because, you know, that's what was paying the bills, you know. So yeah, no, it was, uh, uh, very interesting, Quiet Storm, and somebody said they still have a few of those four minute kind of things out. Mama, I heard Papa call himself a jack of all trades. When the song is released and it's seven minutes long and it's a number one hit, 
The only other group that had ever done that was the Beatles. You guys and the Beatles were the only group to have a song that was over six minutes long that went to number one. Wow. Just showed the other barriers that the temptations were breaking. It doesn't matter how long the song is, people yeah. are going to stick with it. Yeah, you're because right. Because of the, the voices, the storytelling, yeah. the truth that's coming through. Mm -hmm. And it meant a lot to people to hear that song because that came from a, a real place. And another wife. And that ain't right. Oh, it did. Papa was Rolling yeah. Stone. And not only uh, my Dennis's father, they are actually Papa's that actually lived that. Is it true what you say that Papa never watched a day in his life? You know, so I have to clear. Some people say, oh, this loan. Are they talking about L-O-A-N or L-O-N? Yes, yeah, a loan. But bye-bye. Yeah. That kind of loan, not money loan. But Took they, off, they yeah. Say, oh, okay, okay. We always wonder what loan were you all talking about. No, Papa left us alone because he was over there dilly-dallying, you know, somewhere else. Yeah. Said, okay, okay. So it had that truth of element into it. Only the death of alone. It had that truth and, and it yeah. resonated with so many people. Oh, Again, yeah. And that's something that you guys did. Yeah. That people could feel mm -hmm. that music. They're yeah. like, somebody gets it. Yeah, somebody, uh, people actually lived that. The covers, George Michael had a great cover of it. <laughs> Big time. The, those kind of artists doing our stuff. Yep. You know, because we never would imagine that when we started, all we were doing, just being artists, going and singing, and hoping to be another hit, not having any idea that other acts of our ilk, if not even bigger, as far as the pop thing. But tell me, I want to do this thing by the Temptations, you know. So it's always a great compliment when you get artists like that. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about the Temptations classic Motown hit, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. What are your memories of the song? What are your favorite versions outside of The Temptations? I love George Michael's version. You can also get The Temptations' new album, 60, by clicking on the link below. Now, if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below so you always know when our new stuff is coming out. Until next time, three chords, yeah, the truth.